Hi, guys. Welcome back to Girl on Girl. It's your host, P. And if you're new here, hi. <laughs> I'm so glad you stumbled across this gay podcast. Basically, the way I like to look at this podcast is it's just having some open, vulnerable discussions in my bedroom or living room. And you totally get my perspective as a gay Indian Canadian. I've been you know, speaking about my sexuality for many years now, since 2019, actually, that was the first time I released a YouTube video and I had come out as bisexual at the time. And throughout the years and discovering my sexuality and, you know, really leaning into my experiences and how I felt, I came out as a lesbian in 2020, basically on the internet. And that's when I pretty much told like all my friends and family that I was a lesbian and I was only interested in women. So thank you for being here. I hope you really enjoy this episode. I always say that we don't have enough queer representation in media. I mean, it's getting better now compared to the time when I was growing up. And I'm 28 years old now. So at this point, when I see queer media and how much more representation there is, it makes my heart so happy because... I can only imagine for someone who's in high school right now or for people even younger, the fact that they're seeing so much of that is just like normalizing it, which it always should have been normalized. But, you know, when I was growing up, I just I barely saw anything at all. And it was pretty tough. It could feel really lonely. If you're a returning listener, you definitely do know a little bit about my story. Actually, I'm pretty sure my old co-host Sarah and I talked about my coming out story in the first couple episodes of Girl on Girl. So if you scroll way back in like 2021. But what I wanted to do for this episode specifically was dive a little bit deeper into my coming out story and my growing up. I just wanted to get a little bit more vulnerable and kind of talk about my experiences a little bit more, but more so about the loneliness I actually felt as I was growing up and how many queer people, I think, can relate to that experience. And as I've come to terms with that loneliness, and as I talked about it with my therapist and was dealing with so much, like, compet over the years, it's really, like, opened my eyes and, like, everything just makes a lot of sense now. And honestly, to be open and out now and like I'm living my life authentically and I'm in a beautiful relationship with my girlfriend Crystal and we're building a family together it truly just like makes me so grateful to know that I was able to come to terms with my sexuality much earlier on in my life you know like I was in my 20s when I was really discovering this part of myself and owning that part of myself that I just really wanted to use my voice out there to talk about it more because I just feel like when you see yourself in media or when you see yourself being represented on the internet, wherever it is, like books, movies, series, YouTubers, anything like that, you don't feel invisible because for a long time I felt very invisible. I'm going to get into my story and I really hope you guys enjoy this episode and I really hope it resonates with at least one of you. So for starters, I grew up in Whitby, Ontario. And for those of you who don't know where Whitby is, it's a smaller town about like an hour outside of Toronto. It's a little bit more east. And I will say like growing up in Whitby wasn't bad. Like I'm not here to like shit on Whitby and say like it was a horrible experience. I actually had a really good growing up. I had a like really good group of friends in high school and I still have that same group of friends you know, I lived in like a very stable home. My parents were always present. There was nothing wrong with my actual growing up. I just think that there was something about me where I felt I was very, very different. And I didn't really relate to a lot of like the other students in my school. And I even felt this as early on, even in elementary school. I didn't know exactly what it was, but there was something about me that I felt was a little bit different. And when I think about myself as a kid, I was very shy actually but i loved being around friends that's when i feel like i would really just be myself and like always wanted to play i was super active i think i was comfortable in those senses of like being myself but of course when you're a kid you're so new to the world of like crushes and everything like that so i remember being a kid 
and actually really liking boys. And when I look back at some of those feelings, for like right now, I know that I was dealing with COMPET. And for those of you who don't know what COMPET is, it actually stands for compulsory heterosexuality. And the idea of that is that it's kind of where heterosexuality is just like forced upon us as humans because that's how society is. When you're a kid, you're always like seeing representation even in movies of like Disney princesses falling in love with the prince. Or even in like any other movies where relationships are represented, it's always a man and a woman. So as a kid, that is all I knew. So I just knew eventually I was going to grow up to find a really great man and I would get married to that man. And so when I was a kid, I was always like trying to figure out who I had a crush on. Of course, when I was younger, it started with like pop stars and actors and things like that. When I was a kid, I was like particularly fond of um, Howie from the Backstreet Boys, or I'm pretty sure I liked Justin Timberlake and NSYNC, and I would develop crushes on like actors. I remember I really liked Chase Crawford, um, Scott Speedman. Like I could name a lot of men or boys that like when I was a kid, I would be like, oh my God, yeah, they are so my type. I was actually even just thinking Channing Tatum was like a big one for me in high school. I thought he was so, so attractive. But when I look back, I feel like that was really pushed upon not just me, but like everybody as we're growing up. And you almost feel like it's not the norm if you're if you're not feeling those things. So I remember when I was growing up, I would always have like these crushes. And even on boys in my class, like I remember having crushes on them. And I would like pick a boy in my grade and be like, that's the one I like for that year. You know what I mean? I feel like a lot of us did that, but that's where I did feel like normal in quotations because I would like partake in conversations with my friends in class and be like, oh, I do like this boy. But I I also think that when you're younger and it's a lot more innocent and like nothing's really happening, you you just don't really know, right? Like you can look at someone and have a crush or you get the butterflies because you feel like that's what you're supposed to be feeling. But I remember anytime anything would actually happen with a boy or once I got a little bit older and like I would have my first kiss, you, you're experiencing like a bit more intimacy and getting close. I always felt there was this huge wall up. It was a little bit more innocent for me in high school. Like, really, I would mainly just, like, crush on a guy. And I'm saying crush in quotations. But I was really just, like, focused on my friendships in high school. And I will get into this later on. But I was particularly very, very focused on one of my friendships that later I found out I totally had a crush on this person. I was repressing those feelings for her for many, many years. When I look back at me in high school, I feel like I felt, you know what, I don't really have time to like date boys or anything like that, if that makes sense. Like, even if I found out like a guy liked me, I felt like it would freak me out a little bit and I would have this like wall up and not really want to like pursue it. I was always like, oh, I would just rather hang out with my friends or I would really want like my friend to be around if the guy was around too. And I always thought, like, is it because I'm just, like, still kind of young? I'm, like, maybe not really mature enough or ready to start dating? So all of that was really interesting. And mind you, that's only when I, like, actually experienced, like, a kiss with a boy. And I was like, wait, I don't know if this is how I'm supposed to be feeling. Like, why do I not feel excited about this? Like, something is just clearly missing. And it was a bit of a struggle because I was trying really hard to fit in. And just felt like something was clearly wrong with me. But the feelings I had for my friend who I met in grade 10, she was in grade 11. And we met at a dance class and we became very fast friends really quick. Like it was an instant connection. It was like one of those very close friendships too where I think there's like this uh, stereotype with some like female friendships where we're often very close. People hold hands. Like sometimes you'll kiss. And it's going to be funny if some people are listening to this and they're like, no, I never did that with my friends. (laughs) But maybe it's because like me and my friend, there must have been something there, you know, and at least like whatever it was, like that almost felt like my high school love 
this friend, um, the, her code name is Alice. Sarah and I have talked about her on the podcast before because she was such a big part of my coming out journey. And I feel like as queer people, you can probably relate to this, right? Like who else has had a really, really close, close best friend in high school or when they or when you were younger and later you realized, oh yeah, that was not just a friend. I was straight up infatuated or I was in love with this person. So for me, that was Alice. Throughout the four years in high school, for me, it was kind of all about Alice. Like even if I had um, like fleeting crushes on guys or there was someone where I thought, oh, maybe I actually could be interested in him, nothing really seemed to like compare to Alice. And interestingly enough, after it, I, I'd experienced like going on like, well, I guess I wouldn't really say like proper dates with, well, no, I guess there were a date. I went on a date with a guy and I was like really not sure it felt more like a friend like a friendship kind of thing when I, I must I must have been in grade 11 or 12 I actually can't remember but when I had first kissed Alice it was during a party and we kissed at this party and I remember feeling like whoa that was really exciting that's why people are excited about kissing <laughs> honestly like Young me, 15-year-old me, was like, oh my god, finally I get excited about a kiss. And I mean, at the time, I didn't really think about it like, oh, it's because she's a girl. I really just thought, I just feel very connected to this person. Maybe it's because we're just so close and we understand each other so well. So there's more excitement there because I actually really like care about her as a friend. Inside, I'm like totally repressing the fact that I could just be into women and it's because I'm attracted to women that this kiss was very exciting for me. And I started to notice I'd get like butterflies hanging around her or I was so excited to like have a sleepover with her so we could just like hang out and talk all the time and spend so much time together. Like so many little things I look back at now. Of course, like I graduate from high school. I go to Humber College, which is in Toronto, but my campus and the residence I stayed at was more in like the Etobicoke area. So yes, to go from Whippy to Toronto was a really, really big move, but I wasn't moving to the city. You know, I was moving to like Etobicoke, which is still like a little bit smaller. It's on the outskirts of the city. So it wasn't a bad experience. I actually had a really fun time at residence, but the actual area itself wasn't that great. I was really craving the city, but I was excited to, you know, like live in residence my first year. And I I had the notion and like the idea that I can't wait to meet all these friends and eventually like meet a boyfriend. I still thought that even when I was 18 and I had all these sparks and butterflies for Alice, I was still like, I'm going to meet a boy. I can't wait to like finally meet a guy I really like and have a boyfriend and like just feel like, you know, really experience college life, you know? Once I got to college, I made an awesome group of friends and um, I'm actually still friends with a few of them like to this day, like those friendships have carried on. But there was still a part of me that felt so lonely in like my love life. And I guess I could say like even my development is what I thought, like emotional development, because once again, it was kind of the same scenario when I was at Humber my friends in college were so experienced and saying things like they were so excited to be like on a campus where there was all these guys and they could get to know them and go to parties and flirt and mingle. And I would try to, but anytime I like tried to talk to a guy, I just felt like not into it. I wasn't feeling excited. I, if anything, I was kind of avoidant and if anything, it kind of felt like I was friends with them, you know, like the guys I was chatting with. I was like, this feels more like we're pals, but I still couldn't wrap my head around it. And I would kind of like put myself down because I thought, you know, why can't I be like my friends at Humber? And at times, even though I was surrounded by so many people living on residence, there was parties every weekend a lot of times, too, I would visit some of my friends who lived in other places like London and Guelph. Like I had a friend at Western, a friend at Guelph. I would go to Kingston to visit my friend at Queens. So I, I, I feel like I had a really busy calendar in college, like a social calendar. But I felt a little lonely at the same time. And when I look back on those moments when I was growing up, I think the, a lot of the loneliness had to do with not 
feeling seen, I guess. And I'm a very loving person too. Like I knew in my heart, I wanted to fall in love. I wanted to meet somebody. I wanted to experience like a beautiful romance. Like I'm such a romantic. (laughs) I'm a Libra. So romance is like written all over me. I love that feeling. And that part of me was just not feeling that for anybody really I met at Humber. And interestingly enough, you would think like, did I meet a girl in college who I would have had a crush on? But I didn't. I I wasn't really meeting any girls I was attracted to. So of course, then when I'm not meeting any girls I'm attracted to at Humber, I was like, well, then I'm definitely not gay. Maybe I only really like Alice from my high school. Like I felt when I was in Humber, I always wished Alice would come and visit me at residence and we could spend the weekend together and hang out. I really only liked her at the time. But once again, I was really confused about what those feelings were. So that year that I was at Humber was a pretty depressive year for me in the sense like, sure, I I met a lot of great people and I was I was happy to be around them. But when I was alone or felt like I was kind of alone in my thoughts, I felt very sad and I couldn't really explain it because I didn't know what that meant. And I had a bit of a scare living in residence where I felt so lonely and and lost because I was just like, what if this feeling of feeling like numb almost to, to romantic relationships never goes away? Like I knew I wanted it, but I was like, why am I not meeting anybody I like? And it it makes me sad when I look back at that because I feel like if I knew more or if I saw more representation out there, I would have maybe like embraced my queerness more. So that year was a little bit of a rough journey for me. I would try to journal a lot and try to like write down my feelings, but a lot of it ended up going back to like, am I weird or am I weird because I really like my friend who's probably never going to like me back? I mean, Alice had a boyfriend at the time, right? So that was also another thing that was like so confusing for me. I was scared she wouldn't want to be my friend anymore if I like acknowledged these feelings and told her. But I was so young, you know, I was 18, but I was convinced Alice was the only person I would ever like, honestly. And that feeling scared me. It really, really did. I was like, oh my God, what if this is just going to be me forever? And of course, I was so young. And to think that I just want to give that person a hug and tell her like, you're going to be okay and your world is really going to open up. But I think it goes to show that the environment you grow up in or the environment you surround yourself in the people who are around you can really make or break your own experiences. I decided to actually move to the city my second year of college because I could have decided to stay at residence for another year in Etobicoke. But I was really craving the city. I'm a big city girl at heart, and I always wanted to live in Toronto. And at this point, I was like, I'm ready to move right downtown. (laughs) Like, I don't mind if I have to do the commute to Humber to go to my classes. I just know I need to go. So second year when I moved to the city, that's when it really opened up for me. And I lived with Sarah, my old co-host. Shout out to Sarah. Sarah and I lived together for like over six years. (laughs) Honestly, we did. But It was a really good roommate dynamic, and we totally took on the city together as like two young 19-year-olds just trying to figure life out. I noticed when I moved to Toronto, oh my goodness, my world opened up. It's like taking a girl who was kind of in this little bubble at Humber, which was like the residence bubble. People only hung out with people from school. Residence, I guess, actually, when I look back, is kind of small. It's not that big. Take take me from that and throw me into the big city. It's filled with everybody. And I'm so young. I'm living independently with my roommate, living in an apartment. I also got a job too to work after my second year so I could make some money. And I worked at a restaurant right in Liberty Village, which is a really like hip area of Toronto. So you're meeting all kinds of people. And so when I worked at that restaurant, I started to discover, oh, I have a crush on this girl. Or I'm really starting to notice women more. And I remember it being such an aha moment. And throughout that journey, I actually came out as bisexual because I remember, oh, this makes so much sense. Like, I like women. Like, when I look at women, I'm attracted to them. And it wasn't just Alice anymore. And for me, that was a really, really big deal. And it kind of helped me 
feel excited again. Like even if nothing was coming out of these like crushes I had, for me, it was almost like a, oh my goodness, I am a normal person. I just like women. That's really how my mind worked because it took me so long because I was like, I just wasn't seeing it. And at that time, I was getting really into queer YouTubers, like just watching their stories, watching their relationships online. And I almost became like so wrapped up in that community, but in a good way. Like it really, really helped me because I was like, I'm not alone. Like there's people exactly like me out there. And one thing that I also want to point out is that the representation I was seeing was relatable because it was also a lot of femme representation. You know, when I was growing up, the only gay representation I really knew of really was like Rosie O'Donnell and Ellen. And they're not people I personally relate to. I relate more to a feminine presenting person. And I just, I didn't really see that when I was younger, not enough of it at least for it to be normalized. So that really opened up my world and it was really incredible. I was almost like emotional over it. And I remember telling Sarah at the time my feelings about women. She had already known about my experience with Alice. But once again, like most of the time I talked to her, it was always like, oh, I can't wait to like eventually have a boyfriend. And I'd be curious like to actually go back and talk to Sarah about this if she remembers like when I really confidently told her I actually like women or if it was like a natural progression. For me, it was like this huge weight lifted off because I was getting really excited about that. And I will say my parents were so supportive. They they weren't really questioning anything at all. Honestly, they were really happy for me. I think the only thing is that because there was such a lack of representation, my mom was actually like surprised that I had come out as bi at the time because she didn't think I quote unquote looked like a lesbian or looked like someone who'd be into women, right? I think bisexuality was still a term that maybe wasn't used often. And I feel like bisexuality still has a stigma around it. People almost like don't believe people when they're bi. It's so weird. But I never got that vibe from my mom. But she definitely was surprised like, oh, you like women too? Like you don't look like someone who would. And of course, over the years, like there's been so much unlearning that has happened that, you know, you don't look like a sexuality, you look like you and your orientation is like what you feel, you know, it's who you love, it's who you want to be with, it's who you're attracted to, all those things, right? Doesn't have to do with what you look like. You know, I identified as bi for many, many years. I came out publicly on the internet at 2019, but I guess I identified as bi from like 2015 up until 2020. And 2020 was when I was like, nope, (laughs) I am a lesbian. I am 100% a lesbian. And compulsory heterosexuality was a big reason for why I identified as bi. And I'm not undermining my orientation at that time because I genuinely was trying to figure out my feelings towards men too. I was seeing a guy when I was 19 for a few months. And when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I probably was not the best like partner for him at the time uh, because I was very avoidant. And like, really, it's it reminded me of when I was in high school. All I wanted to do was really hang out with like my friends in Toronto. And if he wanted to hang out, sure we would, but I feel like he wasn't really a priority for me. And of course, when I look back at that, it's because I'm gay, you know, like I really saw him as my buddy. Like anytime we would try to get intimate or he would try to kiss me, I would just get like kind of uncomfortable. And he was very understanding. He was not like a bad guy or anything like that. But I think over time, he definitely was like, okay, something's up. (laughs) So to finally come to terms with my sexuality was just such a relief. And to also embrace being a lesbian was amazing because I finally let go of the comp het. Oh my God, that was incredible. And I know people have a complicated relationship with labels and I totally understand that. I don't think you need a label. I think you can just be you and love who you want to love and that can change. Sexuality is on the spectrum. It can definitely be fluid. I'm 100% for that. Just in my experiences and how I feel, it felt good for me to own the label of lesbian and be really proud of that label 
because I was scared of the word lesbian for a very, very long time. When I was growing up, kids in school would make fun of lesbians. Or I remember that saying people would always say like, I love you, but no homo. Kind of back to like looking like a lesbian. What, is that, what does that stereotypically look like? There was such a negative connotation around that word. So for me, I was so fearful of that. And I was fearful of that, especially when feelings for guys, it wasn't getting there for me, but all my friends seemed to be so excited and over the moon and having crushes. I was like, oh my God, SOS, like what's wrong? But now I'm just grateful. We have so much lesbian representation out there in songs and music. Like, oh my gosh, like I I dive into that and I love queer content. And that's why like, I really wanted to start this podcast because I think like the more people that speak out about their experiences, the more you don't feel alone. I never want anyone to feel alone. You know, like the feelings I felt when I was younger were really dark. Honestly, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It was really, really tough at times. I'm so glad I got through it. I have an amazing support system. I also have amazing like family and the people who like stood by me and talked me through it even if they didn't understand it at the time because like I also didn't understand what I was going through at the time but now that I know I can talk about it I don't feel invisible anymore now I love to talk about being a lesbian I love that I got to experience all of this in my 20s and also discovering along the way like what I deserved as well in relationships I think too when I was in my early 20s, I would get very infatuated with someone, for example, like let's say it was a girl. But I think when I look back, it's probably because that person was a girl. And I was almost like excusing their behavior because I just really liked them and they made me feel excited. They gave me butterflies. But as I really was like, I'm a lesbian. I like women. I, I wouldn't settle for anything less than I deserved. I would really be intentional and manifest a partner who would treat me very well and was able to give me like a a stable relationship and that's always what I really really wanted deep down I think like it's so good to give people chances and be open of course but the moment you start to be disrespected or someone's just wasting your time that's an absolute no but when I was you know really discovering my sexuality and feeling so excited about it I was definitely settling a lot of the time and it wasn't good. So I really believe like at the time when I met my partner, Crystal, I manifested a relationship like that. I manifested someone who knew what she wanted and was also very serious about me and serious about building a life together. And younger me can look at that relationship now and be like, look how far you've come. Like you've met such an amazing partner. Like, I really want her to see where she's at now to know, like, you're going to be okay. And even though you thought when you were younger, you were going to be married with, you were going to be married to a man and that's how your life was going to go. It's not. You're actually going to meet the most beautiful woman ever who's so sweet and you guys are going to build an amazing life together and you're going to be really, really happy. And most importantly, you're being yourself. I really want to like tell my younger self that and to not be scared, you know, because I think we all are just trying to fit in. Really, we are. But also, who who made the rule that like heteronormative societies is the norm? Like, why is that the norm? I think we should just be ourselves and you love who you want to love. And that's it. It's as simple as that. Like, I don't know who who said like it always has to be a man and a woman. I think like when you just encourage people to be who they want to be and love who they want to love, it's going to be like a much more beautiful world. I truly believe that. I think we have a long way to go, but the way we're going in that direction is making me feel really happy. You know, I think about my nephew, Chell, who's two, and I'm I'm excited for him to see all this representation and also for him to have an aunt who's gay. It's really, really sweet because he knows my girlfriend, Crystal, and he associates us together. Like, I, he understands that. And my parents told me a really sweet story, actually, where Chell was looking at, like, these um, photos. It's, like, one of those frames that are, like, digital, so the the pictures, like, slide through. 
um, and they're constantly changing. So it's really sweet. I forget what it's called, but you know, technology, it's pretty great. <laughs> but Chow was looking at those photos and he had seen his mom and dad, which is like my sister and my brother-in-law on their wedding day. And Chell is so smart. He was like looking at those photos and he was like, but where am I? Because he just doesn't understand. He's like, why am I not in these photos? And my parents had to explain to Chell that this was before you were born. Like this is where your mom and dad got married. You just aren't there yet. And Chell saw a photo of me at the wedding too. And he knows me as Auntie P. So he's looking at me and he goes, where's Crystal? And when I tell you my heart was exploding, like that's an understatement. And the reason I was so excited about that is because I was like, here's a two-year-old kid who's so young, but he understands. Like to, for him to see his aunt with a woman and to be like affectionate with a woman and not like bat an eye, he just sees it and just knows Crystal and I are together or like at least we're associated with each other is so sweet and for me i'm like that's where i just want to see the world go in that direction where it's normalized like let's talk to our kids about queerness and we got to keep showcasing more queer rep because the more you know chell can see that he can feel comfortable in himself too as he gets older like no matter what that is and i'm so excited to like watch him on his journey as well so yeah i really hope you guys liked this episode. I feel like there's a lot more to tell about my story for sure. I think I touched upon the main things. The biggest thing I wanted to like to get across is that every day is like a work in progress. We're doing the best we can. All I'll say is I hope this podcast resonates with some of you. And I know not everybody's circumstances are the safest. Like I can't just tell you like be you, be authentic, be your authentic self. Like Yes, I want to tell you those things, but I also understand it's not that easy. And there's a lot of things we need to face. Like it could be the environment you live in where being gay is against the law. Like I can't be encouraging that if like it's unsafe for you. And sometimes it's unsafe for family situations. Like you could get kicked out. Like I completely empathize and understand all that. What I would encourage is I hope you can get some access to more queer media and like find some communities online where you can meet other like-minded people and talk about queerness together, you know? My DMs are always open either at Persa San or Girl X Girl Podcast. Please, please message me. I would love to be able to talk to you or also be that guide for you or just just talk, you know? We can have chats. Like I I would have loved that when I was younger to have someone to talk to, especially when I was like going through my completely lonely phase and felt like the world was ending <laughs> essentially. So I'm here for you and I hope at least through this podcast you can get a little dose of that as well and we can talk about even more topics. I drop episodes every single Monday, so expect to hear more from me <laughs> for sure. I'm going to be... Uh, definitely getting some guests on the podcast too so you guys can hear some more queer stories i just want to share all the queer stories so all of us can just like be a big queer family and no one feels alone you know anyway i am gonna wrap it up there once again i love you guys so much and i hope you have a really really good rest of your week <laughs>